Hi, this is entry 19 of Bill Atkins' life. Today we're going to continue with patriotic stories and end with a patriotic song. So Bill, why don't we start with your family history in the military? Okay. I. I think the best thing for me to do is to start out with Nimrod. He's uh, the, one of the earliest relatives in this country. He and his brother came over from England um, because one of them accidentally killed the other brother. Uh, it was an accident. And, but the father said, guys, you know this country their laws are stupid, and they will put you in prison for the rest of your natural life. So I want you guys to get everything together. I want you to go to the new world and start your own lives, and let, let me know how you're doing. And they said, all right, Dad. So the two brothers, and there were more than two brothers, but these two were able to get along real well, so they got on a ship and came over. And I believe that they came into Jamestown, Virginia, because they settled in Maryland. And uh, Nimrod in about 1690 had purchased some land in Maryland and so I mean I found that record so so that I know that the, he was settled or settling in in Maryland um, about that time so um, I don't know what year he was born, but it was probably in 1650 or 60. Um, he was in the Revolutionary War. As I recall, he was with the Wilcomico Battalion of the Maryland Militia. And he obviously was a very loyal fighter and he was very careful, and he did not get killed, thank goodness. And uh, I don't know about his brother, if his brother got in the same thing or not. But uh, when the war was over, he was started uh, back to, I'm trying to think where it was, my, my a cousin of mine lives in that town where um, Nimrod settled, and I cannot think of it. I'm sorry. <clears throat> but um, he settled in this town, and um, um, he helped start a lumber co company and the name of the company was the Adkins Lumber Company. And today, that still exists. That's how many hundred years old it is. And up until about 20 years ago, the company was always run by an Adkins. And uh, Helen, my cousin, her husband was the last president of the company. And when he died, it was decided that another worker there should be president. So they, that was the end of the Adkins reign in the Adkins company, or lumber company. And um, he obviously was very loyal to this country. Um, he, he never got in trouble, as far as I know, and uh, he had a nice big family, and uh, he started having babies, and they started having babies, and they started having babies, 
and slowly the family drifted from uh, down in uh, by the coast um, in the Chesapeake area up north to uh, Annapolis, Maryland. And then they went from Annapolis all the way over to Ohio. And in Ohio there were about three different uh, generations born there. And one generation, uh, the kids I guess you could say they almost piled into a truck and took off to Illinois. And uh, they settled in Illinois. And uh, one of the more famous Adkins was Charles Adkins. He was Speaker of the House of Representatives in Illinois in 1921. And uh, he was very popular uh, with other politicians. And uh, he was always, always a uh, leader in the family and helping out people. On the wall there in the kitchen is a sale announcement of Adkins Ben, Benjamin F. Adkins farm and it was all the items that they had for sale they sold and Charles ran the whole thing and uh, his brother uh, was a money taker and so on it was kind of interesting but um, they kept a number of things for the for my grandmother, and uh, um, she she lived um, about twenty more years after that. Can you tell me about your dad in the military? Okay. Well, I just wanted to kind of br bring you up to date with the, the family, my grandmother, because. I don't want to lose that connection. Um, my dad was going to high school in Monticello, Illinois. And I guess he just got disgusted with high school. Don't ask me why, he never told me. But uh, he and a buddy of his decided to go west. And they decided to go to Montana and try to get a job on a ranch. And so the way they went, how they went, I don't know. I'm sure they probably hitchhiked though. And uh, they found a ranch that needed people and they were hired and they worked for I don't know how many years, but they were happy doing what they were doing and they were not of an age that they really wanted to get married. So they were content on this ranch. Well, in the meantime, World War I started and um, they were kind of interested in helping out the war effort but they loved the ranch. So they stayed there. And after a while, the government said, we, we need volunteers in, to, to enlist in the army to fight the Germans over in France. And, and um, so my dad and his buddy decided that they should do something for the country. And they hitchhiked back to Monticello, Illinois, which was the county seat for Piatt County. And when they got home, uh, they kind of settled a little bit. And uh, my dad, I'm sure, talked to his mom. And uh, 
suddenly they decided to go ahead and enlist in the army, which they did. And <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think. That's about what what occurred. Let's tell about your brothers. Well, let me tell you about my dad, finally. Okay. Um, he was stationed at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and uh, he went through um, artillery school, and one thing that attracted him was a motor bell-driven motorcycle. They had a number of them, and uh, a lot of guys didn't know how to ride them, and they hurt themselves seriously. And my dad just loved the motorcycle. So I guess his sergeant said, that's yours. So instead of a rifle, he had a motorcycle. And um, he finally got transferred to, um, I think it was South Carolina on the East Coast to prepare to go overseas to uh, fight the Germans. And um, his, he and his buddy separated, but they promised each other that they would write faithfully to each other for forever. And that's what they did. That's what they did. My dad was, I don't know, just before he died, he saw his buddy. And I met him and he was in uh, Arizona and California. And uh, I, was, I was blown away by that, the warm friendship that they had endured all those years. So w the war was declared over before they could get on a ship and go over to Germany. And that would really tick my dad off because he really wanted to go. Because he said, hey, the fighting's going to be fighting, but I will maybe get shot at riding a motorcycle, but mostly I'm taking messages from one guy to another. They didn't have messaging system like we, they do today. So he got, they got transferred back to Monticello and discharged. And that's when he met my mother. And uh, they, uh, they were eventually married and uh, raised my two brothers and I, and we've had been a happy family and a happy life. Okay, that's dad. Now, with raising three sons, Frank was the oldest. And Frank, well, World War II, uh, excuse me, the, World War II came and went, and our cousins, which was our our grandmas, I mean our uh, aunts, my dad's sisters, two boys, they were both in World War II, and um, that part of the family. But that, the, the, their mother was an Edkins, but she was married to a guy named Lower, L-O-H-R. And the two brothers, um, did what they could for the war effort. One was stationed in Ohio and uh, was always a communications guy. And the other one went to Australia and helped out there. And don't ask me what he did, I don't recall. But um, Frank and Ernie did their thing for the war effort. And then along came the Korean War. And uh, Frank, my older brother, decided that he wanted to uh, help out. And so he enlisted in the Army, and uh, started, he completed his basic training, and uh, for some reason his major uh, did not let him have a furlough home after basic training. And he, they kept 
holding back, holding back, and my dad got mad. And he was working for the Navy Department at the time, and he went through Navy channels, and finally the commanding officer of the base where my dad was, was told, you get this guy a furlough and send him home. And so um, he, he did. And my uh, dad, of course, uh, called my folks and, and said, uh, boy, I finally got released, I'm coming home. And uh, he talked about basic training with my twin brother and I. We thought, oh boy, oh boy, who wants to go through that stuff? Well, you have to. That's the way the rules are. And um, Frank then finished his furlough and went back to Tacoma, Washington. And... Um, that was Army, right? Huh? Army. Army. I'm sorry, Army. And... Uh, Frank loved basketball. He just loved basketball. And so he started playing for a basketball team, their, the military, and uh, really was having a great time. And I don't remember what the hurt was, but he got hurt really bad. <clears throat> and he was in the hospital for about six months and finally recovered. And the doctor, uh, um, finally said, Frank, you can't do us any good. So I'm going to arrange for you to get a, f a discharge. You can go home. And he did. Well, during that time, the government was having problems finding guys to be in the, in the military. And uh, they decided to draft men. And uh, my twin brother and I, Sam and I, had to sign up. Uh, I can't remember what the form was and all that stuff, but anyway, we had to sign up, um, put our name in for uh, eligibility to be in the Army. And uh, we could also ask for the Air Force or the Marine Corps, but um, it was strictly an army thing at that time. And um, I can't remember everything, but um, when um, Sam and I got done with basic training, I got in the reserves. But didn't you go Seabees instead of Army? That's what I did. That's what I did. Ah, Seabees. That's what I did. I changed over to the Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I had experience uh, in construction, uh, they gave me the rank of third class petty officer right off the bat. But that's what it's construction battalion, CB, that's what it was consisting of. Experienced guys ready to do whatever they were ordered to do. And what they primarily did during the Korean War was to build airfields and, and uh, uh, Quonset huts for the guys to be um, put uh, For them sleep, to live in. Sleep. Yeah. And um, so I thought that was awesome. And my first assignment was as a mechanic, because that's what I really loved. And um, so I worked in the, um, the area where they had all the, the uh, trucks and cars and so on, and uh, motor pool. God, I can't think of these words. We're doing and, good. And I wor worked in the motor pool, and then um, I had a chance to cross rate uh, to operator and uh, because I had driven a lot of the construction equipment 
and um, I cross rated and um, shortly after that they said I was eligible or would be eligible to be uh, a second class petty officer but um, I had a um, commanding officer who uh, thought that those of us who are eligible should wait and to see if they re we really were qualified to be a second class petty officer. What can you do? You can't do anything about it. You have to, that's the decision, that's the decision. And uh, I was uh, sent to Port Wainimi, California. It was a CB base and um, uh, started learning how to be a trainer or a teacher um, for operators. And um, I went to uh, San Diego. And uh, in San Diego, there's an area called the Coronado, the island of Coronado. And uh, that's where they had a large CB base. And there, I taught operators how to operate bulldozers and motor graders and uh, pile drivers to put piles in for wharfs because that's another thing we had to do was build wharfs for boats to come by and unload. So uh, I had my job and um, funny thing, um, the the mil or the government decided that the CBs should have a ship designed for their equipment, and they call it an LST, landing ship tank, and it was had a flat bottom, and we would go on maneuvers out on the ocean, and of course the boat is rocking back and forth, back and forth, and sometimes. Almost all the guys were hanging over the, the railings, vomiting because they were, couldn't take that movement. And it never bothered me one iota. I just took it in stride. And um, finally, uh, I came back to Albuquerque and um, I stayed in this, the reserves uh, for another five years and um, I graduated from college and went to Boeing Airplane Company and I stayed in the reserves there and Boeing was very good to me regarding reserves they said if you have to go and for training we will pay the bill and I thought, boy, wasn't that nice? And, and I did, I did three times I went for training. So they paid the bill and I uh, got my regular salary and so on, which was really nice. And uh, I, uh, I was pretty happy about that. So here, my, my great, 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 great grandfather was in the army. My dad was in the army. My older brother was in the army. My twin brother got drafted in the army and he was at Camp Roberts, California. And here I was Navy. <laughs> but no one said a word to me about it. They were very proud that I was serving, doing my thing. And thank and, you for your service, for sure. Would you sing a patriotic song for us, My Country Tis of Thee? I'll try. Okay. Sing first, and then play. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of my country's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring.
Thank you for your service, Bill.